uh, I just want to hear about beginnings, how you started playing guitar, why you kept playing guitar. Can you talk a bit about that? That's a favorite topic. Um, uh, I was born in Los Angeles, California and uh, in 1956. So by the time I was 11, 12, 13, it was the late 60s. And um, as such, uh, I would say a potent time for pop music, if not music in general. And so I became infected by uh, the sound of rock and roll. Maybe when I was about 11 or 10, I started getting really into it. You know, the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan. Um, wasn't super moved by that because I, my, I have a twin brother named Alex who's a drummer percussionist. We thought the Beatles were for girls only, basically. So my brother was all about the Rolling Stones and I, as such, had to embrace somebody and I fell in love with the birds initially. And of course listen to the Stones all the time because my brother did. And then we just became rock and roll obsessives um, and started playing music together. So, uh, And I was terrible. I started playing around age 11 or 12 um, and knew nothing about how to tune a guitar. I didn't know anything. And I didn't have a teacher until uh, high school. And that's a whole other story. This guy was terrible and almost destroyed me for the rest of my life. But anyway, uh, um, I think the moment, and I've written about this actually for uh, uh, John Zorn. He has the Arcana series, sure, Musicians sure. on Music. I wrote about um, this moment in an article for him where uh, my brother and I were sitting around listening to the radio on a Saturday afternoon. And uh, one of the top 30 stations uh, played Manic Depression by the Jimi Hendrix Experience. And uh, my brother and I had seen this record. We'd, we would save up our allowance every two weeks we could buy a record. Um, we'd ride our bikes to the cheapest uh, spots for records. And we had seen this record, Are You Experienced by the Jimi Hendrix Experience when it came out, but hadn't heard it yet. And we knew it was cool, but we'd also bought s several records based on how cool they looked and they weren't always that good. Right. You know, like the West Coast Pop Art Experimental Band or Blues Magoo's records, they looked really cool, but there is usually maybe one or two good tracks, in my opinion, on some of these kinds of records. Right. Well, anyway, we knew right away when Manic Depression came on that this was the Jimi Hendrix experience just by the sound, by how we had imagined the sound of the cover and the, the look of the band. Um, and, I, and I remember we were literally running around jumping up and down wow. because we were so excited by the sound and then when when uh, when Jimmy goes into the ascending unison line and he sings along with it and goes into his guitar solo that was pretty much the moment I think I knew I was going to play guitar forever because wow. I felt like I was being zapped by electricity it was like pure inspiration and magic and um, and after that it was easy to keep going just because I enjoy playing and enjoy sound so much. So in spite of, I would say, a lack of business acumen and, and certainly a lack of uh, financial security for the first, you know, 30 years of playing, um, playing is enough for me and it, and it always has been and I think it always will be. I think I derive a kind of almost uh, uh, simpleton's pleasure from uh, the as soon act. as the sound starts, it's just as soon as sound starts up, and I feel something good could happen, everything's cool. All right, so let's talk about uh, songwriting process back in the day, as opposed to songwriting process now. Is there a particular formula structure that you stick to when doing Not it? At all. Going blind? What's the? Well, it's very, it's uh, extremely varied. Okay. I do write on the guitar. Although not always with the idea that it would be guitar, it's just that I need something since I don't have a piano nearby and I'm not a pianist uh, to know what notes I want sure. to play and what notes I want to write. So, um, so there's a combination of things. I'd say that there are a few categories that these compositions fall into. One is the uh, the song based on something that I'm playing that I think sounds beautiful that should be played, wow. which tends to be maybe rather idiomatic in terms of the guitar. Maybe there's some, a lot of open strings, there's some sound, a chiming sound, a hook of some sort for me that makes me want to write a piece to feature that. Right. So it's something I'm excited about sonically that has some kind of sense of lift or drama or gives me goose flesh or something. So there, there are those tunes which sometimes become what I call my fascistic pieces because they're uh, filled with directives for the players, usually dynamically or 
uh, in other words, we have to play it kind of as a as a written composition rather than as a, a springboard for improvisation. Right. Then there are pieces that I come up with that are almost more what I call utilitarian, which uh, are ways to feature the people I play with and feature their personalities. Okay. And so sometimes maybe all that need, all we need for that is to, uh, for me to write a line that we can just take off from, and then maybe some something that we're going towards, like some sort of weird coda, so we all know we're going to this ending place and anything can happen in between. And then there are pieces that are uh, uh, really attempts of, uh, on my part to write notes that I think are good compositions, which tends to be mo maybe more like uh, ballads, usually. Wow. Um, and they are based on either chords that I like or a melody that I heard in my head. The new uh, record by my band, The, the Singers, we just finished, and I think three of the pieces on that record were written in probably under 10 minutes, but were based on something I woke up with in my head in the morning. Wow. Just something really simple, because the music's, re a lot of it's really simple on this record, I think. And there's a little uh, piece I wrote in the studio in about 10 minutes, and there's another piece I wrote sitting, uh, about to go play a gig up in the Bay Area where we were recording, but we were gigging up there too. Wow. Um, and I just thought, wow, we, we, don't, we need something with, you know, sort of a, with, a, with an ostinato groove, with a sort of like a bell of the cymbal, you know, neo-Latin thing, um, which I have probably one on every record like right. this. But, but uh, so I wrote a new one. There you go. And uh, sort of combination of the utilitarian and the sort of maybe a nice composition. Some of these I've found, I think the reason I persist in this direction is that I found that over time, there's a piece called Sunken Song. It was originally on a record I did here in New York called The Inkling with Mark Dresser and Billy Mintz and Zena Parkins. And this piece is just a trio with no Zena and it's called Sunken Song. And it was written really quickly for the same reason this new piece, uh, Canalis Cabeza on the new singer's record was written. Have this kind of, well, we need something a little more up, you know, something we can kind of open it up and have an ostinato and just sort of succinct and and I find over time that these are really fun songs to play and just go you go a half an hour do it three minutes it's, it's just uh, they hold up for me somehow even though they seem tossed off at the time wow. um, so I think in that way I also subvert my tendency to have things become elaborate and and uh, overly directed right is that something you're fighting a lot well, I mean, I just don't think it's always that fun right. for the players, you know, I mean, just to have a script. Sure. So uh, it's fine for me. Right. You know, I just think that since I play with great improvisers, I should let them improvise. Good call. So so it's, it's trying to strike that balance, you know. I think that when we all improvise, then I can get out of my own way, too. They can contribute and I can react to them rather than just be thinking about whatever my obsessive aesthetic is at the moment. But I like to balance it. I like to have those events happen because I think that there's a maybe an implicit kind of transformative experience that we can have, and I, I can at least pretend that we can have it. Um, this is an area, I think, where my brother and I still uh, share a, uh, a certain commonality, because we're kind of into drama and music, which is not so jazzy, you know? Sure. Um, and, uh, and in terms of playing rock and roll with Wilco, for example, I, I just really dig not only the band thing, and we're all, uh, the, we have a lot of trust or whatever, but but also this sort of the pageantry, the inherent pageantry of, of lights and big sounds and, and uh, that kind of a show. It's different from playing improvised music, and I like to have that balance. Right. So even my own stuff tends to veer towards the pageantry a little bit for, for improvised music. It's maybe a little bit didactic. In terms of Wilco, it's probably more traditional uh, on the surface at least, in that uh, the last two records for sure, Jeff comes in with songs, on, plays them on acoustic mostly. He probably wrote them on acoustic guitar, right. sitting around his, in his uh, office, his little study or whatever, sure. um, or wherever. And sometimes he has words, a few words, sometimes he has a lot of words, sometimes if it's a rock song, sometimes he just spews nonsense right. over the top of sort of the vibe that he wants which is some of the coolest stuff he's ever done, I think. Why? So he can he comes up with these funny things that sound like Marky e. Smith or something from the fall. He's like, wow, where did that come from? Wow. But he loves garage rock. He can channel this garage rock voice. Awesome. But, uh, but then the process of 
where this can go and how it can become a Wilco song can become quite, uh, I don't mean arduous in a painful way, but arduous in a, a labyrinthine way. Sure. It's like, it could take forever. A little bit of this, Pat might suggest a, a chord turnaround, and then we, it, it, this goes on. We de demo the songs uh, in our loft when we barely know them. Whenever Jeff thinks like, okay, this is close to being something, let's record it now. Wow. And then we move on, and then we readdress it over time and that's and he can listen in his car he can cogitate and that's how that process works and quite often I'm stumped in Wilco I sit there thinking what am I gonna do on this song wow. it comes strumming away and I go Pat will pick up his Telecaster and I go oh great let's see should I play lap steel he's playing guitar now and I go through this whole thing and it's usually way late in the process that either I come up with an idea or I'm screwing off and Jeff hears something or Jeff just pushes me and says Look, right. you know, why are you being so reverent to this material? <laughs> why don't you just get in there and, and and mess it up so we can have some place to start from? Right. So make a huge mess and then see where that leads can be uh, one of his methods. And uh, and in that sense, not so different from from Mike Watt or even Ben Goldberg's sure. way of getting results out of me. There you go. Um, by basically pushing me to not be too tasteful or not be too timid or, or too uh, reverent, right. you know. In my case, I'm usually hearing some classic guitar thing because some of these songs, for, for example, of Jeff's particularly, they're so uh, classic that I tend to hear, you know, uh, I don't know, you know, Dwayne or Eric Clapton in my head or Stephen Stills with Buffalo Springfield right. or something and he's trying to get these tones and, this, and everyone's looking and you're like, Where's, what happened to Nell? Jeff's very conceptual. And he also doesn't like to repeat himself in terms of his methodology. So, you know, on uh, Sky Blue Sky, which was generally a more team-written record, was also us recording in a circle in the loft with tiny little amplifiers, no headphones, wow. and uh, and it's a modest uh, sounding record by by design. Right. It doesn't have big drum sounds. It doesn't have lots of processing. It's not super compressed to sound louder than everything else. Um, and then the next record, Wilco, the album, we did everything. Jeff wanted to do everything on the computer. Wow. So it was all analog tape, tiny amps. <laughs> then then Wilco, the album, all on the computer, tons of overdubs, layered. So I privy to all these different processes. But, but frankly, recording improvised music or so-called jazz music is what I was used to more. And still I'm kind of more comfortable with because it's a shorter process. Sure. Um, although I'm taking longer to make my records now than ever before. I think now I'm up to four days. Wow. Because frankly, one of the least favorite things I do uh, in music, at least to hear it back, is solo. Right. So I don't like to hear myself solo that much. So I'm always trying to figure out ways to justify soloing or to not solo. Wow. And um, I, I find that that uh, playing in a trio all this time, I'm just getting more and more frustrated and not it's not getting easier. Right. I originally formed a trio in 89. It was the first band I ever led. It was the one called Nels Klein Trio. And the goal was really to keep it small because it was economical sure. and also to force myself to play better to front a trio, which is technically difficult, I find. No question. Now I feel it's still just as hard, if not harder, so I feel I play better when I'm playing off of somebody um, who's playing sort of in my register, whether right. it's a saxophonist, clarinetist, accordionist, another guitarist. <clears throat> I love playing with other guitar players. So that always makes me more comfortable right away. Right. So I, I think I might just have to add somebody to the band. <laughs> <laughs>